Welcome to How to Money with Cole and Cole. I'm Cole. And I'm Cole. We coach people every day on their money and how to plan for the future. As financial advisors, we're here to have an honest conversation and educate you on how to money. Intentionally and passionately to hit your money goals. And we'll throw in some sports talk along the way. Our mission and goal of this podcast is to improve your money journey and help you create the financial life you deserve. So let's talk money. And sports. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to How to Money with Cole and Cole. This is episode number nine. Uh, we're getting really close to that double-digit episode. That'll yeah. be next time. So uh, yeah. how's it going, Cole and Cole? Uh, not bad, Cole Peterson. Not bad. Great, great. And a uh, little congratulations to you, newly married. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah, Thank congratulations. You very much. Thank you. Was, uh, she actually said yes, right? Yeah. Or did she just pass out and not, not have to worry about it? Yeah, well... I, I can't confirm nor deny either <laughs> so, one of those. It's all a blur generally those days, right? Yeah. yeah. It's out. like the anticipation on the things going and then yeah. boom, it's like, holy that, crap, it's all done. That yeah. week went by so fast, yep. but uh, right. that was great. So yeah. Um, My sister-in-law got married the same day as you. Yeah. Uh, June there were, 25th. Yeah. There were, um, I know of five weddings that day. All right. Well, so there you go. I like I was personally friends with one of the people and then I've heard about, oh, well, I can't come because this extended family member is getting married oh. or whatever. So um, yeah. yeah, it was it was great though. But. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So uh, we are back with the How to Money with Cole and Cole show, and I heard this little rumor from the little birdie that Cole Peterson beat Cole Jasky in a golf tournament. <laughs> so yeah, so so a little little bit for our for our oh listeners. Boy. Oh um, boy, we we've heard that we're a little long on sports, so we're gonna keep it a little bit tighter when it comes to that. So you you won't have to fast forward as much if you're not interested in sports. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, uh, we played the County tournament this last weekend, Cole, how, how, how did it go? Yeah. So, uh, not good for me in the, but, uh, you know, the, the central financial group office, uh, we had three out of the four in the final pairing of the, of the championship round. I, I unfortunately, uh, was the, the, the bottom end of that, uh, you know, as the competitive office we have, unfortunately that happened, but, uh, the two boys beat me, uh, I had a rough, um, you know, I don't want to make excuses, but had had quite a few penalty strokes. Had to get back the field there. So throughout my tournament, no, Cole's laughing here. Right, right. Ever, <laughs> Cole's like, yeah, I just, beat uh, you. <laughs> just because. So me and Cole and Eddie go on this golf trip every year. We've gone to Tucson. And we've gone to this place, and then after the golf tournament, we had one of our one of our uh, people that go on the golf tournament, Justin Jorgensen, set out this text. It's like the the guys that are on the golf tournament or the golf trip, you know, there's the guy that drinks too much. There's the guy that <laughs> that's always hitting on women. There's the guy that does this, the guy that does that, the organizer. That's me. The guy that does all the, you know, groups and gets all the handicaps. Cole is the guy that his round always should have been about six to seven points better. <laughs> strokes better. I, and I like everybody it. agrees. Cause yeah. Cole's always like, Oh yeah, I three put it. This will I four put it. This will I hit one out of bounds here. Oh, it should have been 65. Should have yep. been <laughs> it's not 74, but should have been 65. That's, uh, the, that's the truth. Uh, that's <laughs> golf in a nutshell though. I'll say we all, every time you get done playing, you're like, gosh, darn it. I did this, this, and this, but you forget about the things uh, that where you made a long putt or, you know, you, you remember the bad stuff. Un, un, unfortunately with golf, it's always like, gosh, what, what could I have done better? You know? Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh. I feel like that's a lot of things. Yeah. You're, we focus, we yeah. get focused on the, on the things that we didn't do well versus you forget about all the positives, you know, I'm like, Hey, I did this, this, and this well, but it's kind of the nature of being competitive. I think. You right. Know, oh yeah. Like, right. You're, you're always, yeah. always trying to be yeah. perfectionist. Yeah. Yeah, you trying want to be better. You um, could be playing yeah. basketball and shoot 14 to 15. You're like, well, this is what I messed up on the 15th yep. one. Right. Yep. Just right. That's part yeah. of it, which is not a bad thing. Um, but no. um, For sure. Yeah. So today we are going to be joined by a special guest, uh, John uh, Engler from the Johnson Law Firm here in Fort Dodge yep. area. And uh, so I'm going to step away in a minute and he's going to be talking with Cole and Cole about um, lots of different things. Lots of things. Yeah. yeah. I was going to try and give it a topic, but the list well, has several attorney. different things on it. So. so so a lot of times me and Cole have to say the, the disclaimer, we're not attorneys. Uh, we're not <laughs> accountants. We're not a lot of different things. We're financial advisors. So we, we have to defer to people like John and, and have the legal um, background that have the legal background and obviously the, the ability to do things that we can't do. So it, we thought it would be good to bring John on because we use him as a, a liaison between uh, us and our clients. And he's going to discuss uh, wills, trusts, financial plans, how everything relates um, you know, on the legal end. 
Gotcha. All right. So I'm just, we're going to get right to this because I know that he's going to have uh, good content for you and um, I don't. So I'm just going to give my chair to him. So um, we're just going to take our quick break, hear a word from our production team and John Engler will join you after that. Nice. This podcast is produced by Spin Market and Digital. Located in Fort Dodge, Iowa, Spin Market's highly skilled team can help you increase your market by updating your website, improving SEO, designing advertisements, and producing podcasts that will grab the attention of your market. Contact Spin Market today for all your digital marketing needs at digitalagent at spinmarketwith2ks.com or call us at 515-302-8026. And to learn more, visit our website at www.spinmarketwith2ks.com. That's digitalagent at spinmarket.com or 515-302-8026. Or visit our website, www.spinmarketwith2ks.com. All right, guys. Welcome back. Uh, got our our first outside uh, the organization uh, guest on here, John John Engler. John, uh, local. You know, we got a Fort Dodge crowd. I'd say maybe maybe a little wider. Hopefully, a little wider scope than that. But why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about uh, your background, how you got here. Yeah. So I'm John Engler. Uh, it's good to be here. I think this is my first official podcast. All so, right. So pleasure we did to be with both right of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm an attorney at the Johnson Law Firm where I specialize in estate planning, real estate, and business law. Uh, I primarily serve clients uh, here in Fort Dodge and then the Western County area um, on Monday mornings and Friday mornings. I'm in our gallery office. Otherwise, I'm predominantly here in Fort Dodge. Uh, I'm originally from Fort Dodge, was raised here, and then I went to undergraduate school at uh, Briarcliff University where I played a little basketball there. Yep. All right. Yeah. Another, uh, another basketball. Another guy that can yeah. beat Bailey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we Bailey, that's kind of a running running sports thing. Think she, she thinks she can beat everyone at basketball. So. Well, Bailey and I basically grew up together at that's the Fort Dodge Rec, so we spent right. a lot of time shooting hoops there. Uh, and then I went to law school at the University of Minnesota. So after law school, I returned here back home and... Uh, that was about 2016, so I've been practicing here for six years now. Okay, okay. And how good is Bailey at basketball? <laughs> I love that. That's oh, the first question. Boy. Just say Bailey hears this. You. Oh, I love it. Uh, she's pretty good. Is she? She's okay. pretty good. Oh, we might That's, be in trouble. I know, yeah. I know. I I've never seen her really I know. play. She's, yeah. she, she's, she's, a, she's, a, she's a, you know, pretty confident in her talk. Oh, yeah. so, so that's where I'm like, I think she's probably pretty solid. She's so. definitely confident on the basketball court. Yeah, yeah right. but I, I can attest to that. Mm -hmm. But no, she's a, she's a hoops junkie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about how our businesses cross paths and when we when we reach out to you, John, a little bit. And uh, there, there, are, there are several different things that you do. So we're only going to talk about the things that really relate to our business. Um, so we a lot of times will say, you know, uh, someone needs a will, uh, you know, they've got assets and they need a will. Talk a little bit about, you know, why people need wills why people maybe, maybe well, I think everyone should have a will in my opinion, but if, if they don't have a will, what happens uh, after that? So talk a little bit, first of all, you know, why people need wills. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's important to have either a will or a trust, just an overall estate plan. Um, because with those uh, instruments, you can certainly dictate where your property is going to pass and you can select who you want your property to go to. With any sort of estate plan, you're going to have more control over your assets, more control over your affairs. And as opposed to if you don't have any of those instruments, then you're going to have to rely on the default will that Iowa law provides, which is through the rules of intestacy, which essentially says your, your property is going to pass to these specific individuals and you have zero control over it. Rules of intestacy just sounds bad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't want anybody to go through the rules of intestacy. Yeah, that that sounds, com you know, overwhelming. Maybe an overwhelming word for some people to think right. about. But and of course, with us attorneys, we like to throw that legalese at you. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Use right. those big words. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. estate planning yeah. and and all that. So, um, you know, one of the most famous things that's ever happened while while I've been a, a financial advisor is Prince dying without a will. You know, and obviously his estate's yeah. huge. And that's still, that battle's still going on, I believe. I mean, it's just, 
it, so talk about someone dies without a will, this rules of intestacy, but people can also uh, contest the, the decision uh, from a judge or from a court, correct, uh, about, you know, what happens to their, their, whoever passed away their estate. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, yeah, there are a lot of misfires of the rich and famous when they don't have an <laughs> estate plan, um, Prince being one of them. But, you know, some of the issues just with even sometimes when you do have an estate plan, whether it's will or trust, but you commonly see it in uh, situations where people don't have an estate plan where something gets caught up in litigation mm -hmm. because some people think that they're the rightful heirs of this person. And a lot of it depends on the specific situation. But even when you do have a will or a trust, and you pass away, there's still a, a certain procedure, and it's commonly referred to as a state administration, also known as probate or trust administration, where you have to go through this process of notifying the heirs, beneficiaries, and then they're given an ability to potentially contest the will or the trust. And typically, that's a four-month period. There are variances with that, but yeah, you can certainly have some will contests, trust contests in, in those situations. Yeah, I think that's, you know, you hear some of the horror stories of, of everyone knows a family that's had a, someone pass away and whether they farm land or there's multiple siblings and there's things not, you know, legally weren't planned ahead and there's friction now between the family or family right. members I've don't seen speak. and tear families apart. Yeah, and that's, that's the, you know, in our shoes, we, you know, we're dealing when someone does pass away and, you know, we have to help you know, administer their assets that we might have helped manage. You know, that's the last thing we want to see, you know, from a family, you know, a, a family happen to you. So that's what we're always recommending. You know, people talk to people such as John or, or you know, their, their estate planning attorney to make sure that, you know, something, the worst case scenario does happen. You know, things are, they at least have, you know, something documented and, and then also communicated. I think that's also a, a big part, um, yeah, big part. For sure. You said an interesting word that that I hear a lot from people that they want they want to avoid probate. Explain what probate is, because I think I know approximately <laughs> the answer. But uh, just just explain what probate is, and and typically you want to avoid probate. It, is that is that correct? It depends. Okay, that, that's going to probably be my response to a lot of these. So it really depends on the actual family situation. So what probate is. In essence, it's a court-supervised process where you administer your will and you have to go through a formal procedure of uh, publishing notice, getting your executor, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, the person that's going to be responsible for administering the estate, getting them formally appointed by the court, and then just a lot of court supervision and making sure that uh, you're following the correct laws as far as an executor, um, taking care of all creditor claims, taxes, and then really what remains at the very end gets distributed to the beneficiaries. The reason why I say it depends is because in some family situations, it does make sense to have some court intervention sure. or court supervision. Yep. So mm -hmm. that way you already have the court overseeing what the executor is doing, can make rulings, orders as far as how it affects the distribution of property and how certain heirs or beneficiaries will be handled. But, you know, predominantly the court is supposed to follow the testator, uh, the person who drafts a will, uh, follow the testator's intent and wishes as far as what is documented within that last will and testament. Yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, to your point, Cole, you know, they're just there are fees and costs associated with probate, sure. you know, whether it's court costs, executor fees, attorney's fees. And so just with any sort of court supervised process, there are potentially some additional fees. Right, right. So, it, it, and I think uh, the the will process, it's not it's not so simple, but it, but it is, I mean, it, you're really not doing a whole lot except naming who, who's going to get my assets who's going to be in charge of distributing those assets, the executor, um, and really what are my final wishes? It, it's, uh, I think that people have this misconception that this will is this long document and they got to make a hundred different decisions. You really don't. In my mind, you don't. 
That's it's, correct. It's pretty simple. Yep, you're exactly right. So uh, a lot of it depends, too, on what your financial situation is and right. what the family dynamics are. But if you're looking to keep it pretty simple where you leave everything to a surviving spouse, otherwise in equal shares to the children, yeah, then it, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than what it is. I think that's, you know, one of the, you know, there's many misconceptions, right, about our industry, about, you know, wills, trusts, um, but maybe transition a little bit of, of some of the misconceptions you see, you know, hear about, or maybe more specifically to the will, or if you want to compare it, I know we're going to talk a little bit about trust here in a little bit, but some misconceptions, we hear a lot of things, you know, we're like, well, um, again, that old, you know, we're not an attorney, we're not going to give you legal advice, but, you know, you probably should speak to someone because that's not how we interpret it or understand it. Yeah. You know, one of the, the biggest misconceptions is where people come in and they say, I don't want the state to take my, my property. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pay any taxes yes, and I don't want the state yes, to take my property. Yeah. Yep. yeah and, and I'll, what I'll say to that is, you know, we get back to the laws of intestacy where Iowa law provides a default will for you. And this isn't just in Iowa. This is in all states right. where they're basically saying, if you don't have a will, we're going to dictate where your property goes. And it's typically situations where you as a person that passed away would want your property to go to. So if, if you pass away and you have a surviving spouse and children from that uh, surviving spouse, then everything would go to the surviving spouse. But then where it gets complicated, if you have um, children from a previous marriage, right. you're remarried, then that's where you see a lot of fights happening or when you may not have children of your own or uh, you don't have a spouse. So rather than relying on that, that's where I would heavily recommend that you get a will or a trust. But to me, that's probably the biggest misconception. And, you know, other times too, I'll have a lot of people say, hey, I need to get a trust. I, I hear that you save on taxes that way. Well, it, it's not that simple. Um, and especially in it depends on your financial and uh, family situation, but yeah, a, a trust can be advantageous in specific situations, um, but also a, a will does a pretty nice or a, an effective job too. Right. I, th I think that that is something that, that I get asked pretty frequently is, do I need a trust? And I'm like, well, what, you know, what are your possessions? You know, do you own farmland? Do you own uh, multiple houses. Do you, you know, is there someone that, is there some reason that you would need a trust to divide up these assets or a would a will suffice? Um, so explain the situation where you think, okay, we're kind of cross the line that you need a trust uh, opposed to where we would just need a will. So typically the way I break it down is um, both are effective in disposing your property uh, there are certain things that you can do if you're worried about the estate tax, and I can certainly get into the estate tax mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later if you'd like me to. But as far as why people generally prefer ro revocable trust, and that because there's a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust, and trust created while you're alive, trust created while when you pass away, so it gets complicated in that respect. But the two primary estate plans would be a will-based plan and a revocable trust-based plan. So when people are wanting a revocable trust-based plan, typically they're wanting to maintain a sense of privacy. So as far as when you retitle assets into your revocable trust or you list beneficiaries on beneficiary designation forms or list your trust on a, as a transfer on death designation or payable on death designation, you're doing that to maintain a sense of privacy. And the trust administration is outside the scope of the court. Right, because because if you if you go the other way where you don't have a trust or, or a will that dictates things, that is public information. That's exactly right. So through probate through the probate, probate process, yep. the public or people can look up you know look up a lot of that that information that's going through that process. Correct. That's exactly right. And so as far as the probate process, because it's a court proceeding, it's a matter of public record. Mm -hmm. So people generally try to avoid. Uh, showing an itemization of all their lists or of all yep. their assets at the time that they pass away because through the probate process, you have to list an inventory of all of your assets. So I would say maintaining a sense of privacy is priority number one for a lot of clients mm -hmm. if they want to move toward the revocable trust-based plan. And then also just saving uh, on the expenses of the probate process that we talked about earlier. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, they don't want they don't want uh, you to know, Cole, that Annie M left you five hundred thousand dollars in property. You know that that's yeah. what I mean. That people would see that or yep. be able to dig that up, that information up. Uh, Cole didn't inherit that money, by the way, but <laughs> if it. he did. <laughs> Um, you know, if you didn't have a will or, or trust, you know, that would avoid probate, that people would be able to see that information, which, you know, I, if I inherited a bunch of my own, I would want people to know about it. Exactly. Is there, John, is there, um, you know, a, a threshold, I guess, where you would say, obviously privacy may be number one factor or, or has to be a big piece of that for the, the revocable trust, you know, estate plan. But is there, is there generally, you know, where you're seeing like a, a common asset size or, or net worth where, where it seems to be more common or is it just kind of, you know, specific based on the, the person's individual goals? That's a good question. I, I would say what I've seen more is it's totally dependent on the person because when you go through a revocable trust-based plan, there's a lot more work up front. You have to retitle assets. You have to get beneficiary designations changed. There's just more work involved. And, and some people, and this is truly a thing. Some people have a difficult time relinquishing ownership in an asset. So they're, they're accustomed to seeing their name on the farmland. Yep. But if they have a trust-based plan, now the trust is going to own the farmland. Yep. So there's that uh, emotional attachment mm-hmm. to just seeing your name on it and owning it personally. So it depends on the specific person because in reality, if their wealth uh, reaches a certain level, there are still other things that you can do even with a will-based plan as far as some, um, some tax planning. Yeah. The best, the best thing to do, I think is talk to an attorney. I mean, uh, cause agreed. everyone's situation yep. is different. just like when we tell people talk to a financial advisor, yeah. because everyone's situation is different. We don't know if you're going to need these things until we actually sit down and know what you have. It's a common as like, uh, People think, you know, everyone should be, have the same type of plan. You know, like what, what do other people my age be even doing? And I'm like, well, my goals are different than John's goals, different than, than Cole's right. goals. So same thing, you know, in your, your world is people have different ideas, you know, where, where, and how the assets transfer. But I think that's, you know, another misconception is, is it's an asset size or a net worth size. And people are like, oh, okay, I'm, I've got a million dollars in, in net worth and I need a trust. And that's not always the case, you know, or based on their situation, but one question I have maybe, because I, I get this a lot from my, I think it's a common practice for me to ask who's your state you know, attorney or who's your attorney, you know, we ask and then, and we go into, okay, do you have a will or a trust? You know, if it's a new, new client or prospect to me and one thing, okay, yeah, I do have a will or I do have a trust, but I haven't looked at it in 10 years. You know, what's something, you know, what's your recommendation or, you know, uh, how often should people be looking at these documents or maybe, you know, um, you know, making changes to them as, as a state, you know, a state law changes or different, different probate law adjustments. But what, what do you normally uh, recommend or, or do with your clients? So generally I recommend to my clients that uh, we review their state plan every two years because okay. laws are constantly changing. Family dynamics are constantly changing. So I, I think a, a good time frame would probably be every two years. I'm overdue, John. No, <laughs> <laughs> we can change that right now. <laughs> no, okay. Cole, no, Cole P. You're not going in my will. Oh, shoot, <laughs> shoot. But, oh. you know, you know, to that, because there are so many different uh, situations, you know, I'm just thinking of ours here, you know, we have younger children. And so I do think a will or a trust is appropriate for the majority of situations. Right. Right. So a lot of younger families may think, well, we don't have a substantial amount at this point in time, so we don't really need anything. Well, I mean, in our situations with minor children, for instance, within your will, if something happens to you and your spouse, you're nominating who you would want as the guardian of your children, or you may not be comfortable with what you have going directly to your children at some of the the age thresholds that the law provides. So you may want it to go into some sort of testamentary trust or a trust uh, created further by your revocable trust to provide when those children will be receiving those funds. Right. Right. You don't want uh, you know, an 18 year old getting a million dollars. I mean, I would love that, but it, 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 it would be, 
a, yeah. a little tough for that person to manage that. So, right. You probably, but if you have a million dollars and you're 18 years old, come to central financial group <laughs> and ask for Cole Peterson. <laughs> um, just joking. Anyway. Um, so another, another common thing that I get asked is in about the trust is yeah, I, I don't want, I don't want the government to get, or I don't want the nursing home to get my money. You know, so I'm going to get a trust and then put it, put all my money in that trust. And then the, now I'll go on Medicaid and I'll, you know, the, the money, my money will go to my beneficiaries and I won't have to, um, you know, pay for nursing home care. Obviously that is not how that happens. Um, but talk a little bit about that process. And I know you're going to bring up an irrevocable trust. So explain kind of a little bit what that is. So to break that down, so what you're talking about with the nursing home uh, would just be Medicaid planning. Right. And uh, it's a very complex area of law that it's going to be very challenging to break that down on a podcast like this. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But in essence, an important thing to keep in mind as far as Medicaid planning, there is a five-year look back period when you have a transfer of assets without uh, full fair market consideration. So people think that just by putting something into a trust, they're by relinquishing ownership, they're removing that as far as their countable resources for Medicaid purposes. But in reality, they're not, depending on what sort of interest they retain, whether it's an income interest or if they fully relinquish all ownership, then you have to wait a certain amount of time. And that's the five year period. But so I'm just going to explain the five year look back a little bit quickly. So if you do apply for Medicaid, um, they are going to look at your finances for the last five years. And if, if you moved all your money into a trust two years ago, they're going to say, no, that you're not going to get Medicaid because you did that two years ago. There's a five-year look back. So that's, it's not something that that's why you want to plan early too. You, You don't want to try to plan when you see the nursing home in your in your future very quickly, it, you know, you've got to look five, 10, 20 years down the road and, and try to get things arranged. And that's why, you know, we want to, you know, to bring attorneys like John into those conversations to bring that up and say, well, you got a network, you know, $5 million of farmland or whatever it is in nursing home, you know, is a big scare of yours or, or you feel like that's going to be something that's going to be relevant. You need to have those kind of planning conversations. So understand the mechanics. And if there are some, type of, you know, different strategies that uh, someone could use. And I think that's, that's why planning ahead and, and trying to be proactive in the estate planning conversation is, is important. A lot of this has to do also with like with retire. I mean, with retirement planning, what we yeah. do, like you don't want to try to plan a retirement two months before you retire. It's, it's hard to do for us. I mean, we do it with some people, but it is a lot harder than if we got you in your forties or fifties and started planning yep. 20, 25 years ago. So, um, planning ahead is, is it's kind of a pain in the rear and, and it, it takes time and, and a little bit of funds, but you're going to be happy if you do that. I mean, there's not a lot of people that plan ahead that are, are unhappy. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we had talked about earlier about uh, revocable trust and irrevocable trust. So it's important to note that there is a major distinction between the two and it's exactly how, how they sound, right? So with a irrevocable trust, you're relinquishing the ability to revoke what you put into that trust. Can't change it. Exactly. So that's permanent. Now there are certain mechanisms where you can try to change it just through state law, but we're not going to go there today. But, and then with the revocable trust, you can revoke it, alter it, amend it at any point in time. So for purposes of what's includable in your gross estate, when you pass away, revocable trust is included because you had that ability to revoke, alter, amend it at any point in time. So it's just like it's treated as your own asset in your name alone. Nice. Nice. Well, um, do you have any other questions for John? No, I I don't think so. I, I know it's super helpful for me. I always, always learn something when I, when I talk to John, when John comes in meetings, I come out and my mind's like, like, I, I always learn something. So we appreciate you being here, John. We appreciate everything you do for our clients at Central Financial Group. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I do want to state too, I, I didn't mean to interrupt there, Cole, no, but go for it. I, I think it's really important for clients to know that as far as the whole estate planning uh, process, you know, typically this is what I recommend to my clients that when they come in, they have a list of all of their assets, debts, and really gather all information, including 
you know, making sure that we have contact information for all advisors. Right. So when we talk about the estate plan, I think it's very crucial to have an estate planning team. And that doesn't only include the attorney. It includes the financial advisors, uh, accountants to have a team Mm -hmm. because everyone works together here as far as making sure, because we're on the same page, we want what's best for our clients. So if we can have that open communication, uh, it's really advantageous. So I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, no, you're good. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's well, well said too. Yeah. You've got to have a team of people to get things done correctly. And, and, um, that's why we, that's why we use people like John and we use, uh, you know, our, our preferred accountants and, and things like that. So I also want to throw a disclosure out there that, you know, anything we discuss on this podcast is not legal advice. So, uh, don't take any of it, uh, to, uh, to the, to that level. But, uh, you know, if you want to get a hold of John, obviously he's at Johnson law firm. If you want to get a hold of us, we're at central financial group. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, uh, at Cole Um, Cole, you're, you're on Twitter. Yep. Are you on the Instagram? No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm just on fa- Facebook and LinkedIn. Oh, so on Facebook, you're on, LinkedIn, you're on, you find book, it, you're on the book face. Yeah. Yep. And you can, uh, you know, find us on, on the website. So yeah, central financial uh, we're, we're available. So if you want to look us up, we can get you in contact with John, but we appreciate you being here, John, all your expertise and, and, and thank you for all you do for our clients. Thanks guys. I yep. appreciate it. Thanks, John. Take care. You've been listening to How to Money with Cole and Cole, the podcast of Essential Financial Group, courtesy of Spin Market. Learn more about the Central Financial Group on their website, www.centralfinancialgroup.com. For now, I'm Cole. And I'm Cole. And we'll see you on the greens. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associations Incorporated, Member FINRA SIPC, Royal Alliance Associations Incorporated is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associations Incorporated. Material discussed is meant for general informational purposes only and it is not to be construed as tax, legal, or investment advice. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Diversification does not insure against loss. Any guarantees discussed refer only to fixed insurance products and are backed by the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company.